redundant pacemakers. I'm going to talk about an article in The Scientist, which pointed me to another article. Um, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, the, the article in The Scientist was entitled, Heart's Backup Pacemaker Mechanisms Identified. Most of you may not have known that there were backup pacemakers, but there are. The sinoatrial node is home to multiple pacemakers that keep the heart beating if the main one falters. And uh, this is found on the internet, as you can see, it's a fairly recent uh, article. Um, it starts out, in humans, the heart's sinoatrial node acts as the body's pacemaker. That's something you'll learn if you go into uh, medical school fairly early. A new study published Wednesday, July 26, in Science Translational Medicine, reports two backup mechanisms that may prevent heart failure when the organ is faced with arrhythmia. Why is that important? Because sometimes the heart is faced with extra adenosine and uh, without backup when you had that kind of thing happen to you you could just simply die right there on the spot this is the first step in explaining why the sinoatrial node can be sluggish for years before a total failure allowing the clinician to detect the problem before a catastrophic event study co-author Raul Weiss a cardiologist and research at Ohio State University said in a statement. By the way, most of the people who wrote this are from Ohio State. Sorry about that, uh, Ariel. <laughs> Weiss and colleagues used a variety of techniques, including 3D tissue reconstruction and molecular characterization on samples from 21 donated human hearts. To observe heart function, the team placed live tissue into glass chambers filled with an oxygenated solution and simulated blood flow through the coronary arteries. When the researchers added adenosine, uh, for what it is worth, you've probably heard of ATP. That's adenosine triphosphate. So this is the adenosine with all the phosphate groups stripped out. So it's adenine attached to a ribose molecule. <clears throat> they discovered um, two backup pacemaker mechanisms in the head and tail regions of the sinoatrial node. Now, notice that adenosine is produced in high quantities during ischemia and heart failure. So if your heart were to go a little bit bad, then the adenosine would take over, and instead of um, uh, stimulating your heart to do other things, which it's supposed to do, all of a sudden it makes the heart stop, and then at the first hint of heart failure, you would die. But there are backup mechanisms to keep that from happening. <clears throat> the central pacemaker was most affected, as it is highly sensitive to adenosine. The head and tail pacemakers were able to maintain a slower rhythm and prevent complete cardiac arrest. We saw similar shifts in the preferred conduction pathways. Study co-author Vadim Fedorov says the release. I'm not sure exactly how that fits. Uh, total cardiac arrest occurs only when all pacemakers or conduction pathways fail, whether due to disease or age. So, you know, eventually the heart does stop, obviously. The mortality rate is still 100%. But um, it goes for a lot longer than you might expect because it was designed so that if one pacemaker didn't work, the other pacemaker takes over. And the other pacemaker is slightly different, so you can tell that it's not working quite optimally, but at least it's still working. I'm skipping over another paragraph. Robustness though, uh, through functional, structural, and molecular redundancies is an important property of the human 
sinoatrial node, which allows it to efficiently maintain its automaticity. That means it keeps on making a beat without having to be stimulated by something else, because something has to start the heart. And conduction, that is, you've got to get that automaticity out to the rest of the heart, even during external and internal perturbations, the authors write in the study. More detailed knowledge of the human sino sinoatrial node complex during normal and pathologic conditions is fundamental for the development of novel treatments for sinoatrial node arrhythmia. So we may be able to take this knowledge and design drugs that help to normalize the function of the sinoatrial node. That's the hope anyway. Um, the article they were referring to is found in Science Translation, uh, Translational Medicine, I believe it is. Um, redundant and diverse intranodal pacemakers and conduction pathways protect the human sinoatrial node from failure. Now, the abstract is available for free. If you want the actual article, you have to have a subscription or you have to have a university subscription and fortunately this is one of the journals that Loma Linda University gets and so I was able to read the whole thing and I'll give you um, uh, some samples of what it has to say. There's, it, it's too new to have an actual page number at least that I can find um, but it is uh, it is, uh, when you get it online, you have two things that uh, pop up. One of them is an official abstract, which we'll look at next. But one of them is a little thing called keeping the beat. And the only thing I can figure is that it must be a kind of popular abstract. The human heart beats more than 100,000 times per day. And I'm sure that um, um, that little thing wouldn't appear in a uh, a professional article, so I think that's why, or that's one of the reasons why I think this is a popular summary. Arrhythmia, or irregular heartbeat, can occur due to heart disease, changes in diet or hormones, electrolyte imbalance, or for other reasons. But these inconsistencies only infrequently lead to total loss of heart function. Lee et al. covered uncovered how the heart is hardwired to maintain consistency. Optical and molecular mapping of human hearts ex vivo, coupled with electrocardiograms and histology, revealed that the sinoatrial node is home to multiple pacemakers, specialized cardiomyocytes that generate electrical heartbeat inducing impulses. This means that multiple conduction pathways can deliver, well actually that's slight inaccuracy in summary, but we'll, we'll let it pass for now. There are actually two things. One of them is multiple pacemakers, and the second one is multiple pathways. And they're independent of each other, which means redundancy in two different directions. This means that multiple conduction pathways can deliver the electrical impulses required for rhythm control so that total cardiac arrest occurs only when all pacemakers and conduction pathways fail. Or actually, be precise, all pacemakers or conduction pathways fail. Understanding inherent cardiac robustness may d help develop treatment for arrhythmias. And that's the hook that's supposed to get you. Um, because some of us are getting into the range where um, having our hearts beat is uh, of uh, more immediate concern than when we were younger. Uh, <coughs> the uh, human sinoatrial node efficiently maintains heart rhythm e even under adverse conditions. However, the specific mechanisms involved in the human sinoatrial nodes, this is the actual abstract, ability to prevent rhythm failure, also referred to as its robustness, um, are unknown. Challenges exist because the three-dimensional intramural structure of the human sinoatrial node differs from well-studied animal models. So you can't translate from, let's say, the 
mouse or the dog straight over into the human. <coughs> and clinical electrode recordings are limited to only surface atrial activation. Uh, maybe in the middle of a surgery you could put some electrodes there, but um, people for some reason don't like it if you take out their heart and start experimenting on it. Um, <coughs> Uh, hence, to innovate the translational study of human uh, sinoatrial node structure and functional robustness, we integrated intramural optical mapping, 3D histology reconstruction, and molecular mapping of the ex vivo human heart. So basically, they took human hearts, we'll get to that as to how they got them, and um, they looked at the um, they looked at the histology, they looked at the molecular structures, uh, looking for s certain specific receptors, in particular adenosine ones of two different kinds, which we'll get to in a bit, that apparently work in series with each other. And then um, they also did what they called intramural optical mapping. This is difficult because the sinoatrial node doesn't sit on the surface of the heart. It's actually inside other heart muscle. Um, when challenged with adenosine or atrial pacing, redundant intranodal pacemakers within the human sinoatrial node maintained automaticity, they kept beating, and delivered electrical impulses to the atria through sinoatrial conduction pathways, thereby ensuring a fail-safe mechanism for robust maintenance of sinus rhythm. In other words, it can be started and it can get out of the sinoatrial node. During adenosine perturbation, the primary central uh, sinoatrial node pacemaker was suppressed whereas previously inactive superior or inferior intranodal pacemakers took over automatic automaticity maintenance. That is to say, you stop the part in the middle, the parts on either end start working. Sinus rhythm was also rescued by activation of another um, sinoatrial conduction pathway when the preferential sinoatrial conduction pathway was suppressed, suggesting two independent fail-safe mechanisms for automaticity and conduction. The fail-safe mechanism in response to adenosine challenge is orchestrated by heterogeneous differences in adenosine A1 receptors downstream, um, G-I-R-K, we're gonna come to what that means in just a bit, for channel protein expressions across the sinoatrial node complex. That is that, uh, all the way, there's differences in how much of those two proteins, um, A1R and GIRK4. Only failure of all pacemakers and or SACPs, um, conduction pathways resulted in sinoatrial node arrest or conduction block. Our results unmask reserve mechanisms that protect the human sinoatrial node pacemaker and conduction complex from rhythm failure, which may contribute to treatment of sinoatrial node arrhythmias. Introduction. As the primary pacemaker of the human heart, the sinoatrial node is responsible for generating spontaneous electrical impulses and conducting the impulses to the atria to initiate the heartbeat. It's the pacemaker for the heart, the natural one. The sinoatrial node is a collection of specialized cardiomyocytes located at the junction of the right atria, that should be the right atrium, but whatever, and the superior vena cava. To efficiently keep the heart beating, the sinoatrial node requires a sophisticated ability to maintain uninterrupted function during internal or external perturbations, known as biological robustness. Takes a lot to stop it. In this particular case, literally takes a lot to kill it. 
<clears throat> it has been proposed that the human sinoatrial node pacemaker and conduction complex is a specialized and heterogeneous intramural three-dimensional structure with multiple intranodal pacemakers and several sinoatrial conduction pathways, which are responsible for the transmission of electrical impulses to the right atrium. So whoever is writing this um, found a source, probably their own, that said, we ought to be looking for this stuff. So they didn't just go into it blindly and say, let's see what we can see. They thought, you know, it's got to be better than just one pacemaker and one pathway out. And why is there one pathway out instead of just spreading it out to the whole thing? Well, we're going to come to that. Um, <clears throat> however, the role of multiple intranodal uh, sinoatrial node pacemakers and sinoatrial node conduction pathways in the robust protection of human sinoatrial node rhythm and how this system fails, leading to sinoatrial node dysfunction, um, have remained an enigma. I don't know why they didn't just do S, A, and D, but whatever. Um, substantial gaps exist in data on the pacemaking and conduction functions of the human sinoatrial node. Most current understanding is inferred from animal models which may not reproduce the, clinical, the human clinical phenomena or clinical electrocardiogram, pardon me, clinical electrogram recordings restricted to the atrial surface. They're saying when, you, when they were investigating it before, we had kind of, we had to look at animal models which may or may not translate, or we had to look at recordings on the surface. So they're going more in depth, so to speak. Consequently, studies of ex vivo human heart, that's uh, hearts that ha were taken out for whatever reason, there's a few reasons that were given, provide an opportunity to study human cardiac disease by applying state-of-the-art intramural mapping techniques consisting of near-infrared optical mapping. Um, so I looked at it with near-infrared, which apparently can penetrate tissue a little further than, uh, than ordinary light. 3D, structure, 3D structural imaging and molecular mapping to resolve mechanisms of human sinoatrial node robustness, which are not possible in vivo. This is to look at stuff that, that you can't just look at people or even people during heart surgery and get what you want. The study of biological robustness requires the system to be challenged by external perturbations or stimuli. Adenosine, an endogenous metabolite of the heart and everything else, is known to contribute to the daily regulation of sinus rhythm and is abundantly produced during ischemia and heart failure. In 1985, Watt hypothesized that increased endogenous adenosine production and or hypersensitivity to adenosine could result in sinus node dysfunction, sinoatrial node dysfunction. And it was later shown that adenosine receptor blo blockers can treat sinoatrial node dysfunction. Um, for those of you who have taken advanced cardiac life support, you may remember adenosine is one of the drugs that's used to treat uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Several independent clinical studies have observed that patients with sino atrial node dysfunction exhibit an enhanced bradycardic response and atrial pauses 2 to 23 seconds. 23 seconds is a long time to adenosine bolus. As a matter of fact, those of you who have given adenosine may remember those 2 to 23 second pauses. <clears throat> Thus, adenosine represents a physiologically and clinically relevant tool for external perturbation of sinoatrial node robustness through excessive negative chronotropic de depression. 
That's a fancy way of saying slowing the heart too much. Stimulating an SND-like phenotype it acts like sinus node dysfunction. On the basis of animal studies, the negative chronotopic effects of adenosine, that's slowing the heart too much, or slowing the heart, period, may stem partially from activation of the adenosine A1 receptor, which is hardly surprising. Um, uh, there apparently is an A2 receptor, they wouldn't bother give that. And it's downstream inward rectifier potassium channel. So the A1 receptor influences the potassium channel, um, which uh, is formed by G protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channel subunits. How's that for a long title? Understandably, they don't want to use that term. And so the G protein coupled inwardly rectifying potassium channel subunits becomes G, I, R, and then K for potassium. Uh, GERC1 and GERC4. However, the expression profiles of these key proteins are unknown in the human sinoatrial node. Well, were until this article came out. We hypothesized that multiple intranodal pacemakers and uh, sinoatrial conduction pathways with redundant functions have diverse sensitivities to physiologic and pathophysiologic perturbations, such as too much adenosine, uh, which are fundamental to maintaining robustness of the human sinoatrial node at the tissue level. Using our integrated ex vivo approach, that is to say we took out heart, or somebody else took out hearts for us and we worked on them, we identified redundant and diverse pacemakers and sinoatrial node conduction pathway. So there's a redundant pacemaker, there's a redundant pathway out. Within the human sinoatrial node complex, which ensure a fail-safe or backup mechanism for robust maintenance of human sinus rhythm when challenged by adenosine. They're gonna do only adenosine challenges. There's a lot of other challenges they could have done. Um, but adenosine is the one that, that acts most directly on the heart. Sinoatrial node function collapses when all pacemakers or SAPCs are inhibited. These unique features of the human sinoatrial node pacemaker conduction complex may have implications for developing a robust biological pacemaker or treatments targeting impaired intranodal pacemakers or SACPs to restore the uh, sinoatrial node robustness in sinus node dysfunction patients. So if you're gonna give somebody a pacemaker and it's gonna be a biological one, then you want it to have extra, um, uh, you want it to be robust so that it doesn't fail because if it fails, the patient dies which is why some of us are, well, not myself, but uh, some of us here, I understand, are actually living partly because we have pacemakers. So, the results, internodal leading pacemaker in conduction in the human sinoatrial node. This is the first thing that they're going to establish. Um, Near-infrared optical mapping is currently the only reliable method to delineate activation and conduction within the intramural human sinoatrial node complex structure. And there's some numbers there. That is obscured to clinical surface electrode mapping by the surrounding atria because the surrounding atria mask what's going on. And uh, if you're gonna see it, you're gonna have to use infrared. We optically mapped human hearts. There are 11 human hearts that they used, 34 to 69 years old, uh, five females, which means six males, which means eh, pretty well evenly distributed. From patients with a variety of recorded comorbidities, ranging from no disease to chronic hypertension, diabetes, or acute heart failure. 
At baseline, all coronary perfused human hearts exhibited stable intrinsic sinus rhythm, 55 to 101 beats per minute, with cycle lengths of 819 plus or minus 173 milliseconds. These values are within the range of intrinsic rates measured in vivo. That means that these are what you would expect in people who have autonomic blockade with propranolol and atropine, so neither the vagus nor the sympathetic nerves are stimulating the heart in adult human subjects with diseased hearts, although some fall outside the range previously reported for healthy patients. Healthy patients tend to run a little bit faster under those circumstances. In other words, our hearts are sort of normal. The sinoatrial node is defined by optical action potential morphologies as the region of slow diastolic depolarization and slow upstroke preceding fa atrial fast excitation. So what happens is that everywhere else in the heart it beats, it goes back to the, the normal potential the potassium gates open. In this particular one, in the sinoatrial node, it beats, it goes back to normal, and then it gradually drifts off. And then when it hits a particular th uh, threshold potential, it makes another beat. Ordinary heart muscle doesn't do that. If it doesn't have something else stimulating it, it sits there forever. And so the sinoatrial node kind of is able to lead the band, so to speak. Oh, this is, by the way, um, figure one, and the sinoatrial node is inside of uh, where the right atrium meets the superior vena cava, and. Uh, it's kind of an oval-shaped thing. Uh, here's where you can see where it's putting the beat out to everything else. Just outside the sinoatrial node is where it starts to spread. Um, and so what happens is normally the center beats and it sends through a conduction pathway. There are between two and five pathways. It varies from heart to heart, apparently. But if you have five pathways, this would be one of them, and it would start in the center and go out. Uh, this, this whole thing has, it, it's, when they say heterogeneous, it means that some parts are not like others. But it's not heterogeneous in the sense of, well, we want a cell here like this, and another cell here like this, and another cell here like this, and it's all kind of randomly distributed, no. The ones that are most sensitive are in the center. They're also the ones that usually are the fastest. But if you depress those, ones on the ends, which are less sensitive but less fast, will take over. And you can tell that the heart uh, is beating a little slower than you expect. But it's still beating, which counts for something. On the basis of our previous canine and human functional structural mapping, we define the superior third of the SAN as the head, just because you have to have some kind of definitions, sinus atrial node. The middle third is the center, and the inferior third as the tail, intranodal pacemaker regions. The uh, uh, sinoatrial conduction pathways were functionally identified as the preferential conduction path between the sinoatrial node border and the earliest atrial uh, uh, systole, I believe it is, which could only be defined using um, sinoatrial node and atrial activation maps. So it comes out at a specific point and then it spreads to the rest of the heart. This and previous intramural mapping studies revealed that the sinoatrial node is functionally insulated from the atria except at two to five discrete sinoatrial conduction pathways, which corresponds to the discrete um, early atrial systoles. 
because of heart specific, I'm not reading the whole thing, promise you. Um, and where you see green, that's my additions. Because of the heart specific variations, sinoatrial um, conduction pathways were not always revealed functionally in each region, and all five may not be present in all human complexes. In fact, as you'll see a little bit later in that paragraph, it says the number is 2.9 plus or minus 1.0. That means that in some of them it must get down to two at least. That most of the time you don't have five. Obviously none of them have zero because those people wouldn't make it. After op optical mapping Sinoatrial node preparations were serially sectioned for Mason's trichrome staining, immunostaining, and 3D reconstruction as previously described to confirm the structural basis of functionally observed sinoatrial node pacemakers and conduction pathways. The sinoatrial node was almost entirely structurally insulated from the surrounding atria by a border composed of fibrosis, fat, and discontinuous my myofibers except in functionally defined SACP regions. So most of the time, the sinoatrial node is insulated. The, uh, there are special pathways that come out of it. Why not just have it attached to everything? Well, it, we'll find out again in a little bit. It has to do with uh, other atrial arrhythmias and the fact that the sinoatrial node doesn't get stopped by those arrhythmias. Sinoatrial node activation recorded by a clinical, clinical catheter electrogram. So these are where they recorded stuff. To further support the translational applications of our results, we integrated pseudo-atrial electrocardiogram and clinically used bipolar catheters to record atrial and sinoatrial node activation simultaneously. They're recording right over the sinoatrial node, and they're also recording in other areas. Um, robustness of sinoatrial node automaticity and conduction challenged by adenosine. As an important endogenous heart rhythm regulator and pharmacological tool, adenosine perfusion led to a range of heart-specific sinoatrial node automaticity and conduction inhibitions. Adenosine depresses in different ways, various hearts. From mild bradycardia to sinoatrial node exit block, atrial pauses, and arrest. So you could get slow heart, you could get exit block where it, the, the pacemaker continues to beat but it doesn't get out of the pacemaker. You could have atrial pauses, and of course you could have flat out arrest which provided a methodological framework to study the mechanism of human sinoatrial node robustness. Give them adenosine and see what happens. Contrary to our previous canine study, so one of the, one of the animal studies that was done didn't really prepare us completely for how the human heart worked. Some of the human sinoatrial node preparations experience complete sinoatrial node arrest with adenosine. The dogs are apparently more resistant to adenosine. Maybe they got something else, maybe they're just tougher. Adenosine induced sinoatrial node exit block or sinoatrial node arrest. You can have either the sinoatrial node keeps beating but it can't get anything out or you can have it where it just flat out stops led to atrial pauses during sinus rhythm in five of 11 hearts. That's, that's a substantial minority at 10 micromolar. And in six of seven hearts, as they didn't test the uh, other ones further, uh, at 100 micromolar. That is, almost everybody stopped at 100 micromolar uh, adenosine. Using our integrated mapping approach in adenosine challenge, we revealed that the robust protection of sinoatrial node rhythm to adenosine challenge is heart specific. 
Some hearts maintained rhythm, whereas others experienced failure, manifesting a sinoatrial node arrest and exit block. I should, should say, or exit block. To further confirm that the observed negative chronotropic effects were due to potassium GIRK channel activation, a tertiopin, um, which is another drug that they can give, a selective GIRK channel blocker was added after adenosine perfusion. Tertiopin restored stable sinus rhythm and conduction to near baseline values. And I think elsewhere it was given before and it also blocked the effects of adenosine. So apparently uh, there's adenosine receptor which goes to this GIRK thing which opens it up with, and then if you block the opening up of that channel, then the adenosine doesn't really matter. Robust sinus rhythm maintained by shifts between redundant and diverse pacemakers in conduction pathways. By con combining optical mapping with serial histology images, so in other words, they'll check to see what's going on with the heart itself, and then afterwards they'll section the heart, they uh, section that area of the heart to see what the histology looks like. Um, we demonstrated the consequences of leading pacemaker and preferential SAP sh shifts in human hearts after exposure to adenosine. That is, instead of the middle taking over like it normally does, the one of the ends would take over, and another different uh, conduction pathway would take over. Adenosine causes leading sinoatrial node pacemaker to shift in either superior or inferior directions up to 3.9 millimeters at 10 micromolar and up to 7 mi uh, um, millimeters at 100 micromolar. So apparently it's a dose-related effect. Suggesting two independent fail-safe mechanisms for automaticity and conduction. Um, their work suggests that. Our results suggest that negative chronotropic regulation of human sinoatrial node rhythm relies on the presence of multiple possible intranodal pacemakers and SACPs, the conduction pathways, with heterogeneous sensitivity to adenosine regulation. That's kind of their summary. Um, SAP, SACP, or conduction pathway, uh, conduction filtering during overdrive atrial pacemaking and atrial fibrillation protection of robust SAN pacemaker function. So if you, if you stimulate the atria, messages get out of the a sinoatrial node, but they don't get back in. And that's the intention. Moving on. Um, heterogeneous A1R and GIRK protein expression profile in the human sinoatrial node underlying the robust, robust regulation of sinus rhythm. As our optical mapping consistently demonstrated a high sensitivity of the central sinoatrial node pacemaker to adenosine's bradycardic effect, we tested the hypothesis that expression of A1R and GIRK, these are those proteins that check for uh, or use adenosine as a signal, the main cardiac proteins responsible for adenosine negative uh, chronotropic effects that's, was higher in human SAN center than the adjacent atria. And indeed it was. A1R and GIRK protein expression is heterogeneously distributed in the human SAN and atria. Again, this is gradational. It's not, uh, it's not random and it's not absolute to where there's one level in the center and one level in the other s the side, but it's more of a, it's more of a gradation, which may provide the molecular basis for the regionally diverse response of SAN pacemakers and SACPs to adenosine challenge underlying robust protection. Discussion. We have developed our integrated approach that includes near-infrared optical mapping. We're looking at various different ways of looking at it. Histological analysis and molecular mapping to reveal the functional, structural, and molecular characteristics underlying robustness of the sinoatrial node pacemaker in the conduction complex in the human heart. 
Our results show that the robust prediction of SA and rhythm regulation relies on the integrative collaboration of all sinoatrial node pacemakers in conduction pathways. It's tough because different parts are built differently and can, one can take over from the other if there is a problem with the central one. Intrinsic mechanisms of sinoatrial node function and dysfunction such as fibrosis and molecular modeling have been extensively studied in animal models. However, these animal model studies have also highlighted interspecies variations that affect sinoatrial node function, which means you can't just take mouse, and if mouse doesn't translate into dog, then there's no particular reason to suspect that dog and mouse can translate directly into human. These interspecies differences prevent the direct translation of animal model failings findings to clinical application. Furthermore, clinical studies of human sinoatrial node functions have been limited by surface electrode mapping approaches that are unable to elaborate the detailed activity of the three-dimensional sinoatrial node within the atrial wall. So the redundant molecular functional features of the human sinoatrial complex are Bo at both the cellular and tissue level may be essential for the robust protection of the heart rhythm. Single cell studies of ion channel function <laughs> revealed redundancies that provide robust pacemaking at the cellular level. Our study reveals that the human sinoatrial node complex has functional redundancies at a tissue level by integrating backup intranodal pacemakers and sinoatrial conduction pathways to robustly maintain heart rhythm. So there are backup pacemakers and there are backup pathways out. And only if you make everything fail on one or two of those levels does the heart stop. Skipping over some other parts, taking the central part of a paragraph. Currently the only treatments available for sinus node dysfunction are implantable artificial pacemakers that act as a crutch to support but not heal the heart because they can maintain the heartbeat but have a limited response to autonomic regulation and increased physical activity. If you have a pacemaker, it doesn't start the heart beating faster if you want to exercise, for example. You're stuck with the standard rate. On the, on the basis of our study, we suggest that a successful biological pacemaker, which might be able to get uh, faster uh, if you were to exercise, for example, uh, should incorporate the robust, fail-safe nature of the human SAN complex. That is, look at how it's done originally and try to copy that. For instance, instead of, for example, instead of a single pacemaker, an integrated complex of interconnected pacemakers should be designed, each with heterogeneous sensitivities to known neuromodulators of SAN function that would allow for dynamic regulation and improve protection from rhythm failure. So if you're going to design a pacemaker, this is how you're going to have to design it, which raises interesting questions of whether the first pacemaker was designed but uh, we'll discuss that later. In conclusion, robustness through functional, structural, and molecular redundancies is an important property of the human sinoatrial node, which allows it to efficiently maintain its automaticity and conduction even during in external and internal perturbations. <coughs> and uh, before I go into the materials and methods, I'm just going to point out that I passed over something and, and uh, may not have made it obvious enough, and that is that the sinoatrial node is meant to send messages out but not get them in. That's why you have a preferred conduction pathway rather than just simply integrated into the system. Um, that means that the sinoatrial node doesn't go off in the middle of, uh, let's say, atrial fibrillation. It kind of hunkers down and then waits until that's done and then takes off again. Um, materials and methods. Uh, there's only one part that I think that's particularly interesting, and that is human hearts were obtained from the Ohio State University Cardiac Transplant Team Lifeline 
of Ohio Organ Procurement Organization in accordance with the Ohio State University Inter Inter Institutional Review Board. They needed to say that because, how oh, where did you get those hearts? Um, yeah, um, uh, taking them from uh, prisoners in concentration camps is frowned upon for some reason. Um, <coughs> All donor hearts were randomized for functional or molecular experiments, whereas the transplanted hearts were only used for molecular experiments due to possible sinoatrial node artery disruption. So apparently they got hearts uh, from transplantation um, that I guess were not used at the time that they were available, and so they decided to do research on it. So this is not research that you can do easily. You have to wait for some time before another heart becomes available. Optical mapping experiment uh, set up in protocol and there's the mapping data analysis and they tell you all about how they did it and I'm just giving you the, some of the, uh, uh, the methods that they used. And um, now, uh, my take on this re redundancy appears built into the sinoatrial node and the conduction pathway. Uh, this is a special case of what we've discussed before, which is redundancy. There are other cases of redundancy. For example, all of us could easily live on one kidney. We all have two, which is very nice if you happen to have somebody else who has kidney failure and you can be a kidney donor without sacrificing your life. Um, it's sort of like having spare tires in automobiles. Um, you don't really need them until you do. Uh, racing cars generally don't have spare tires uh, because they weigh too much and they're not worth carrying around. Um, but if you're doing a Baja 500, you might actually carry two spare tires. Um, another illustration of redundancy is magnetos on radial airplane engines. The old line pistons around a circle used to have two magnetos. And two, um, the, basically they're generators. And two sets of spark plugs. And the idea is if one went out, your engine didn't quit while you were trying to climb out of the trees on takeoff. Um, leading to a crash into the trees. Uh, you could get by with only one. Now design often has this feature. Um, the space station has all kinds of design uh, redundancies. If this one goes bad, well, that's okay, we've got this one. Because you know, sooner or later, some system is going to go bad. On the other hand, it's not clear how an evolutionary pathway that's just kind of blindly bumbling through would create, uh, would put in a spare tire. It looks like the human sinoatrial node has two spare tires, one in the front and one in the back. The evolutionary pressures behind this are unclear, and let me explain why. There are three broad possibilities that you could have, okay? Number one, the redundancy is necessary. Number two, the redundancy is completely unnecessary. And number three, the redundancy Mm, sometimes is necessary and sometimes is not. Um, and when we say necessary, we mean it keeps you alive long enough to have kids. Because that is, after all, the function as evolution would, would have it. Now, if redundancy is unnecessary, then it's not clear what kind of pressure would spread this gene to every person. Right? Because it doesn't matter. 
if redundancy is absolutely necessary, then it must have been there in the first place. And how do you get a heart that has that extra design? It's bad enough to try to get a heart that just barely functions. Now you're saying that we need to have a heart that has extra function just in order to get there? Now, by evolutionary theory, redundancy must have, then, it can't have absolute positive effects because otherwise you get into in, uh, irreducible complexity questions. It can't have no effects whatsoever, otherwise there's no reason to have it. So it must have subtly positive effects. Here's the problem. The effects must be exceedingly subtle because we have redundant pacemaker, we have redundant kidneys, we have redundant lung function, we have redundant, I mean, you, you name it, we've got, you know, we all have two arms and two legs. We could actually get by with, certainly without our little fingers, unless you play the piano. You can throw a spear with four fingers just as well, right? Um, so there's lots of things that are on us that are not absolutely necessary. Um, but you see, if you have somebody has four fingers and then doesn't, only has one pacemaker and then only has one kidney and something goes wrong with it, uh, gets infected or whatever. Um, you know, you, if everything is dependent upon only one system, sooner or later something will go wrong and the person will die. And if the person dies before having kids, it's all over, right? Uh, you're not going to spread your genes to the next generation and you're not going to evolve. Not only you're not going to evolve, you're not going to exist. You will go extinct. Your line will go extinct. So the, the effects can't, I mean, if it's, let's say there's a 50% chance of not leaving kids if you don't have extra sinoatrial node. And you have a 50% chance of not having kids if you don't have a kidney function. Well, if you keep adding those up, pretty soon your chances of passing anything along are like 0 0.0001 or something like that. And that's not enough to keep the species going. So the effects have to be subtle. But the problem is that at a certain level of subtlety, one loses the ability to distinguish between phenotypes within evolutionary time. That is to say, you need to, uh, you need to spread this new thing so that practically everybody has it, right? It has to be advantageous enough that somehow um, these people keep taking over. But if the subtlety is too low, then you can't do it in 600,000 generations, which is what is estimated to get between monkeys and or chimpanzees and us. Actually, probably 300,000 is closer to it, but whatever. This is in addition to the problem of coming up with a modification in the first place. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is that natural selection itself can't invent anything. All it does is select from what's already there. The invention has to be done by mutations, by changes, either designed or undesigned. And if they're undesigned, they're random mutations, right? It is not clear how or even whether a blind process could have the ability to construct all of the apparently designed processes, all of these nicely designed, robust, um, kind of fail-safe uh, processes that we have in the body, the sinoatrial node being just one more example. Now notice, uh, I've, I've, of course, read selected excerpts, but believe me, if they had something there, I would select it. But if you don't believe me, go back and look at the article and read it for yourself. Nowhere in the article is the usual biology article's explanation of how this came about through evolution. Now, 
I don't know, maybe the authors are design advocates. <laughs> I've heard about those Chinese, you know. Uh, maybe they're secret fans of design, they don't want to say anything. Uh, maybe there just simply isn't a good tie-in with evolutionary theory. This doesn't show how evolution works, and they just simply left it out because there's nothing to say. Now, uh, now that I've said this, I hope it doesn't trigger persecution of the authors. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment over here. Back in uh, 1975, we uh, were talking about uh, intrinsic heart rates, uh, and we had a dog lab. And so we uh, gave 40 IV propranolol and one milligram atropine to dogs in our dog lab. And they survived that high dose of medication. Went into intrinsic heart rate totally, totally chemically right. denerv denervated, but they survived. We yeah. then got a uh, study protocol and patients uh, signed their consents and we did about 25 patients intrinsic heart rate. We shared that information then with El Caddis at UCLA and they then proceeded to do a study to find out if intrinsic heart rates could identify patients because of the level of the intrinsic heart rate, whether that would identify patients that had better survivability or poorer survivability based on the intrinsic heart rate itself. And that uh, study didn't pan out. But it was a fascinating study on the intrinsic heart rate. So if your intrinsic heart rate was fast or slow, it didn't matter. I have a funny question. How do they study these hearts? They're, the, the heart is ex vivo. Yeah. Yeah. It's dead. Yeah. We've, we've done that at Loma Linda. You connect the heart to a whole bunch of different tubes. You supply the heart through the different arteries with the chemical solution that keeps the heart alive. <laughs> so it's, it, it's on a heart-lung machine. So it's oxygenated. It gets all the things so that it is, it is basically a substitute living m it, machinery it, that's keeping that life, the heart alive yeah. for the study. We've done it at Loma Linda. Yeah. Uh, my uh, my uh, classmate uh, Bailey and I did that uh, back uh, as a research a protocol on hearts back in 19, uh, let's see, 68, 69. Basically, you give it artificial blood, if you like. Sometimes it's uh, dead, but it's with alive. A little ac with a little actual blood in it. Yeah. Okay. Now I know. Just a minute. Uh, there's Mike coming at you. Just to follow up, um, once the study is done, can the heart be put to good use in a living person, or is it discarded? Uh, yeah. That, okay. So the answer is uh, no. Certainly, after the histology experiments here, but the heart's no good anymore. So these are hearts that. They can't put to good use otherwise. I'm going to pass the mic back. And <laughs> Get them both there. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. I love this. <laughs> um, well, just uh, help me understand that you, you could have um, a species with everything redundant except for one thing sort of the last thing to become redundant. So would the probability be, be the multiplication of all the redundant systems that are necessary or just the, the last one? Does that make sense? Well, see, that's the interesting thing. Um, if, if the probability is 50% without the redundancy, that is to say you're going to die, then you have to have all the redundancies but maybe two or three or you just don't have enough living power. 
On the other hand, if the probability is, let, let's say, let's say, uh, five percent improvement or something like that, then you can have. Uh, by the way, uh, by the time you get down to twenty different required redundancies, um, you would have a one in the power of e or one to the one over e probability of surviving, which is not as good, but uh, may be survivable. See, you really uh, can't cut. Uh, you can't cut the reproductive rate down below about, well, you, ha you have to have replacement rate in order simply to survive. And you really need a little more because there's lions out there and whatever, you know, and, and uh, sooner or later some of them are going to get the kids, and so you need a few replacement kids to, to, uh, to uh, take care of that problem. A and so if you're looking at the, you know, the problem with redundancy is that if you put the threshold too low, then the animal with no redundancies whatsoever can't survive. If you put the redundancy too high, then natural selection doesn't have enough of a uh, grasp. If the redundancy makes no difference except once every, uh, say, 20,000, it doesn't even appear on the on the radar, so to speak. So are there, are there I, I don't know this, are there some animals that have uh, certain organs that are redundant, but they simply don't have the other organs that we have redund redundant? Uh, well, apparently the dog is a little tougher than we are in terms of adenosine. But is okay. that because the dog's redundancies are better, or is that because the dog's just resistant to adenosine? I so don't know. Is there, is there anything out there that has like um, maybe two lungs but not two kidneys? I don't know of an animal that doesn't have two kidneys. Uh, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, two lungs but no kidneys. Uh, no, no, there aren't animals that don't have no kidneys. Or at least not re reproducing animals. Uh, even even on the uh, very small scale, like the in in the ocean, what are these things? These um, they stick their head on the, their barnacles. Right? Oh, those, those oh, well, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about jellyfish, jellyfish don't have kidneys. Uh, yeah, or they just excrete the stuff out, and uh, and the diffusion takes care of it. But they don't have anything that's redundant, or I mean. They probably do, but uh, they have their. They're not symmetric. Yeah, I think they. I think they have redundant neural pathways. For what it's worth, but. Um, so you, I mean, uh, theoretically, I suppose that you could have. You know, jellyfish that uh, get the nervous system right, and then something else gets another system right, and then something else gets another system right and in the meantime keeps getting bigger and more complex. Um, and I think that's the picture that evolution would like to portray to you. That actually our senior atrial nodes were perfected a long time before there were humans. Um, that gives you more time to do it. Instead of six million years, you have uh, um, three billion years or whatever it is. Uh, the only problem with that is even there you run into number problems. Uh, you have to, and, and the, the other problem is that you find out that some of these things, when they appear, have all the systems already integrated. That is, you can't tell that there's something defective about trilobites that other uh, arthropods are going to correct later on. Um, I would I would have to be a physiologist to be able to tell or animal physiologist to be able to tell you that uh, for sure, but I rather suspect that the hagfish that live today are pretty much the same as they were supposedly 500 million years ago or whatever, 
which means that when they appear in the fossil record, they are ready to go. There's not half hagfish or stuff like that. Do insects have kidneys? I don't know the answer to that. Um, they have something that, that gives you f the function of excretion, but I don't know whether they have kidneys in the, I'm sure they don't have mammalian type kidneys. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the size of the animal depend. Uh, you know, uh, for example, as far as I know, there's not a kidney in, uh, let's say, uh, planaria or uh, uh, C. elegans, the you know, roundworm, because they're small enough that they don't actually need it. Um, uh, but of course, what that means is that if you're going to get bigger than so big, you're going to need to have specialized organs to take care of certain functions that that no longer can just be done through the skin or the gut, the anus is secreting stuff out. So, uh, go ahead and then... Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting that Med Medtronic experimented uh, for a number of years with a pacemaker that detected uh, motion of the individual to see if they could uh, increase the heart rate with the persons. The second thing that's interesting is that most of these problems with sinoatrial node dysfunction occur at an elderly age, and most of the time that's beyond the, uh, the time of reproductive activity, so that to, for it to even become a, a needed redundancy is very, very difficult to understand. Which means that uh, uh, there's no particular reason why it should evolve for people my age because we're not having kids anymore. I have a simple question. Uh, if there's someone here that's a lot more knowledgeable of evolution than I am, maybe there's a simple answer. But how do evolutionists explain the transition from an animal an ancestor that has no kidneys to an animal that has to have kidneys, cannot survive without it. Where did the first kidney come from? <laughs> That's a simple question. No. Stop asking questions. Uh, no. <laughs> there, there, is a, there are answers for everything. Yeah, I know. And, uh, uh, just, you know, some excretory tissue may start a little bit. That wasn't a kidney. And it developed gradually into a kidney. Uh, this is not hard to envision, actually. Uh, it's uh, awfully hard to explain how in terms of molecular structure, though. Uh, yeah, but... <laughs> it's, it's fine to say, <clears throat> oh, imagine a light-sensitive spot. Um, but evolution did not develop with that, the concept of molecular structure in mind at that time. <laughs> Remember, this developed a century and a half ago. That is true. Uh, when that that is true. It, it's, the, uh, it's interesting to ask, could evolution have gotten off of the ground in the 20th century or the 21st no, century? No, I don't think it could have. I, I, I don't think humanity is that stupid. Uh, now, as an aside, as an aside, uh, uh, which reminds me of a story about, uh, you probably heard of it, uh, in, in this planetarium and somebody wrote a note on the wall and asked, is there any intelligent life on Earth? And somebody wrote below, yes, but I'm only visiting. Um, anyway, with that aside, what, what I wanted to talk about is that uh, another aspect of this redundancy uh, development situation, I think that uh, uh, needs to be kept in mind. It, and this is just this is uh, just a kind of a, a repetition of um, irreducible complexity. But if you're going to evolve a complex redundant system now, and I understand the blood clotting system, there's a redundant system there. 
uh, uh, several steps uh, that uh, also functions, at least in some organisms. Uh, but how in the world are you going to establish any survival of the system when you have one system that's already working and you don't have any survival value until all the steps of the redundant system are working? And, uh, this, and this even then, most of the time you don't have survival value. It's only under certain strange, weird circumstances. Which is why race cars don't have spare tires, is because the weight of the tire uh, is worse for them <coughs> than, than being able to change the tire in case something goes wrong. Yeah, and extending that, uh, or repeating actually, actually what you were saying to a certain extent is, you could argue that a partial development of a redundant system can inhibit evolution because it's extra baggage that you have there that you, that's useless. And that weighs you down a little bit. Yes, it, uh, it's something that's not needed. It's not, it's not going to, it's, it's going to burden you. Yeah. Yes. I'll jump from kidneys to lungs. So I know a little bit about lungs in lungfish. You have the lungfish that has lungs to enable it to breathe by air or by gills in water. So it has a dual function there. But then you have to ask the same question. Where did the lungs in the lungfish come from? What's the ancestor that uh, gave the lungfish the lungs? So. You can trace back all of these ancestors, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you reach dead end after dead end after dead end. Well, and the real question, and this is important, is, and we're just being able to now address that question, is, is can we identify what DNA that you need in order to create those lungs? Because that's the real question. It's not the lungs that you will need to create, it's you need to create the ability to get the lungs and you have to have the information to produce it. Now, if it's three mutations uh, to swim bladder, I got, you know, well, whatever, you know. But if it's 20 different proteins and the lung doesn't work until all 20 of them are yeah. in place, or maybe it works when 19 of them are in place. Now, if you've got 23 proteins and it works with 20, well, then you, once you get to 20, then maybe you have time to develop those other three. But if you've, if, you know, it's the first 20 that until you get there, uh, and I think the, the, that becomes extra DNA baggage. Yeah. Well, take a look at that lung. You've got to have circulation, DNA circulation uh, parameters just to get blood into the lung and out of the lung, so now you've got extra DNA baggage just to take care of the circulatory system, and you need the surfactant system so that you have the uh, lung cells functioning properly. So you're gonna have more than 30 uh, uh, DNA things, probably a 1,000 DNA things modified just to uh, get the lungs functioning. To be fair, well, the fish itself would have a circulatory system already, and all you have to do is figure out how to modify it to go into the lung that you're creating. But the surfactant is brand new. Um, there's going to be a bunch of other stuff that's brand new. Uh, how much is it? And f for those who just simply want to wave their hands and say, well, it happened, oh, that's no answer. Um, what you really want to be able to say is, well, we need surfactant molecule, we need the controller for surfactant molecules so it will only stay in the lungs, and, and, and here are the DNA codes for surfactant, for controller molecule, and go right down the list, and, and the fact of the matter is most of us don't have a clue as to how much we need. Um, but you could do knock out in experiments on the lungfish and find out how much DNA you actually need to make that go that you don't need in fish. And, you know, 
if that's 50,000 basis, come on guys, it ain't happening. Anyway, come back next week and we'll talk about human footprints over 5 million years old.